Hello, everybody. Welcome to our University of Nebraska Feed Yard Extension webinar series. I uh, want to point out um, that if you're watching this webinar online, we would uh, hope that you would be willing to evaluate the program for us and give us feedback. We have some general questions there and a couple specific to, to today's topic. Um, so I encourage you to go to that web address if you would help us and give us feedback. We'd sure uh, welcome and encourage that. Uh, this is a series that we put together that are hopefully topics of interest to our feed yard producers and managers uh, here in Nebraska and elsewhere. Given that it's uh, springtime and, and our wet season, um, we thought it would be uh, prudent and a good timing to discuss uh, monitoring and managing uh, runoff holding ponds. And our speaker is Dr. Amy Smith, who's in uh, who's an extension engineer in our biological systems engineering department and animal science. And uh, she's gonna cover this topic for us today and then we'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end that we'll also record. With that, thanks for doing this today, Amy, and look forward to your comments. All right, great, thank you, Galen. Um, so let's uh, take a look here. These are the, the topics that I wanna make sure we get through today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about routine holding pond monitoring requirements. Um, talk about when um, when a manure discharge is allowed, and what to do if um, if you experience a manure discharge on your operation. And then, um, like Galen said, we're we're in a time of the year when we can get excess precipitation, and so I want to talk about some of the emergency uh, storage management practices that are recommended by. Uh, the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality and UNL. So looking at the routine monitoring requirements, um, we kind of have to separate between whether this is an animal feeding operation that is not um, operating under a state uh, operating permit or a concentrated animal feeding operation that is operating under either a state or an NPDES permit. Uh, so the, the requirements are different between those two. Uh, one thing that's not different is that regardless of the size of the operation or the type of livestock on it, um, it's a violation of the Clean Water Act to discharge contaminants into waters of the state. And so at a very basic level, this means that manure needs to be stored, stockpiled, or otherwise contained so that there is not an issue of discharge of nutrients um, to waters of the state. And then manure needs to be land applied at agronomic rates um, in a manner that prevents runoff and discharge of contaminants from that site. Uh, so specifically talking about animal feeding operations, so these are the facilities that do not have a permit uh, that they're operating under. So without a permit, there, there's really no monitoring and reporting requirements that apply to these facilities. Um, the basic message is that we still don't want to have discharges of um, feedlot runoff to waters of the state. Um, operations that don't currently have a permit but that are um, kind of a chronic um, issue of, of um, uh, nutrients discharging and, and pollution occurring from that site, they could be um, designated by the Department of Environmental Quality as a CAFO. So maybe a small CAFO or a medium CAFO, depending on the number of animals. Um, and, then, and then that person would have to have a permit and uh, maintain records and, and reporting requirements as part of that. So as long as these, are, um, these small operations are managing their runoff, um, they're in pretty good shape. They, they don't have to um, make any reports to the state. It's always a good idea to keep records regardless of the size of your operation, so that if you do have a discharge from the site um, and you do get a visit from NDEQ, you have some, um, some information available to share on how you have been managing that, that operation in the um, manure storage basin. One of the um, systems that we recommend for these smaller operations are vegetative treatment systems. And um, I'm not gonna spend time talking about those today, but we do have information available online through Nebraska Extension about what these systems are, how they operate, and, and uh, what the purpose of them is. And, and they are a, a system to uh, prevent 
losses of nutrients um, directly to waters of the state. Um, like I said, the one thing that's key is, is um, demonstrating compliance with regulations outlined in your permit. So this is true for um, concentrated animal feeding operations, and these are the facilities that um, are operating under a permit. Um, and I think I, I think I messed this up, so the, the orange part is going to stay over uh, over my other text. But um, so these operations have some daily, some weekly, and some annual um, monitoring requirements. And so on a daily basis, um, these folks need to be recording precipitation events, uh, the amount of precipitation in the day and time it occurred. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hop out of here real quick and and get this part out of the way so that it's uh, visible to everybody. Okay, uh, let me know if you're not seeing this, Galen. But um, so daily monitoring and recording of precipitation on a weekly basis. Um, these folks need to be um, inspecting the production area to make sure that any stormwater diversion or runoff control structures are. Um, operating as they should and, and being maintained um, to do what they're intended to do. Um, for the waste impoundments, so in the case of feedlots, the runoff holding pond, um, there's a requirement on a weekly basis to record the liquid level in that basin and, and every permitted operation should have a, a depth marker like the one shown in the picture here. Um, it's not required in smaller operations, but again, good idea to, to know how close you are to uh, that maximum uh, storage capacity. And on an annual basis um, on concentrated animal feeding operations, there's a requirement to inspect um, liquid impoundments and, and make a record of sludge and sediment accumulation in those because that impacts the uh, storage capacity of those, um, those basins. And then along the same lines, um, irrigation distribution system components um, need to be inspected prior to every time they're operated, and they need to be monitored while they're in use. So the idea is if, if something goes wrong, um, someone's there and, and catches that right away and can shut the system down and prevent um, a discharge from occurring. So we know that discharges are not, uh, we don't want to see that. Uh, there are situations where they're allowed. And um, so one of the things to keep in mind is this is part of a permit. It's part of the, um, for, for operations that are operating under a permit, there's a requirement in there for, particularly for beef systems. Um, it's a little bit different for newer um, swine and dairy operations, but for the systems we're talking about today, um, a, a discharge is allowed if that, uh, manure management system has been designed and constructed um, the way that it, it was uh, laid out by an engineer to size it for the correct amount of storage. More importantly, that it's been operated and maintained um, appropriately to contain all the manure and uh, wastewater and runoff that, that goes into that basin. Um, and then if there's a discharge as a result of a 25 year, 24 hour storm and all these other uh, operation and maintenance requirements have been met, that would be an allowable discharge. So essentially what that is saying is design it right, construct it right, manage it right. And if a storm comes along that is um, a 25 year, 24 hour rainfall event, which I think in, uh, in Nebraska probably ranges from um, two or three up to five or six inches, um, within a 24 hour. If that type of event occurs and there's a discharge, uh, the operation would not be, um, they wouldn't be out of compliance with their permit. And so I noted at the bottom there, for, for new large swine and poultry and veal operations, there's no discharge allowed. So these are zero discharge systems. Um, and that's a result of the most recent update to regulations, but we won't, um, we won't talk any more about those today. We'll focus on the feedlot uh, situations. So, um, so what do you do if you have a discharge of, um, of stored manure or, or from the production area on your site? Um, first thing that should be done is, is to contact the NDEQ within 24 hours. Um, this kind of sets in motion a process where they are, they're helping you out, they're, they're um, 
helping you with controlling that discharge and, and giving you feedback on how to handle it the best. Um, within five days after that event, there needs to be a written report provided to the NDEQ. And if they've been contacted um, initially about the discharge, they'll be able to um, share with the producer what needs to be in that written report. But um, the thing to keep in mind is that anytime there's a discharge, um, DEQ needs to know about it uh, right away. So, so that brings us to um, springtime and emergency storage um, pond management. And uh, one of the things that we, we want to stress is that that monitoring of the holding pond or lagoons or whatever type of basin this is, um, that's, that's a very important part. So being vigilant in monitoring and keeping those records that we talked about a little bit ago. Um, there is a URL on the screen here, um, go.unl.edu slash pond, and um, there's a publication available there that talks about the points that I'm going to cover in the presentation. So these are recommendations that we put together uh, several years ago in um, collaboration with the NDQ to make sure that we were recommending the things that, uh, that they want us to recommend. So first and foremost, um, NDEQ really does not want to see your holding pond overflow. Um, you don't you don't want to have it overflow. There's there's options that are better than that. One thing to keep in mind is you shouldn't attempt to build up the berm to increase the capacity. I know some folks might want to fill in the um, emergency spillway or or put um, sandbags or something to kind of contain anything that's coming up to the top of that, but but that's really not a good idea. There's, there's better options. The reason we don't want it to overflow, um, in addition to we don't want to discharge to waters of the state, but if that system overflows, there's an opportunity for erosion on the backside of that berm, and um, that can compromise the berm integrity and, and set us up for uh, an even worse situation if that berm would, uh, would wash out. So I said we don't want it to overflow. The best option um, at, to keep it from overflowing is, is to apply liquid from that storage um, to saturated soil. So if it's raining enough that that, that basin is um, maxing out on its capacity, the soils are going to be saturated. And we know that typically we would not apply manure to saturated or frozen soils. Um, but in this case, it's a better idea to apply the saturated soil than to let that basin overflow. And uh, so there's, there's some kind of an order of where we want to target land. Um, our, first, our first idea would be to target land that has vegetation on it. So um, pasture or hay ground, we're going to get better um, nutrient uptake and filtering of, of the material that's land applied. If that type of uh, land is not available, uh, the next best option would be land that has some crop residue. Again, that will um, kind of keep the, the material in place that's land applied. Um, regardless of the type of land, we want to pick something with the least um, amount of slope as possible so that we minimize the opportunity for um, runoff. And kind of the last resort would be bare ground um, period. We, you know, we'd, we'd like to avoid that application on bare ground because the nutrients are not likely to get utilized and there's really nothing in place there to um, prevent runoff. One thing to keep in mind, um, for a permitted operation, you have a nutrient management plan and within that you have listed all of the fields that you have access to for land application of manure. Um, in this sort of a situation, in this emergency situation, the DEQ is okay with you using land that's not currently part of your nutrient management plan. Um, so if you've got neighbors that will allow you to pump onto their pasture or hayland, that's a good option. The thing to keep in mind is that even if you're going outside that nutrient management plan, you still need to follow the practices that are outlined in your plan, and you need to maintain records of where that material went, how it was applied, when it was applied, um, and then that information will need to be included in your annual report. So um, once we're ready to do that land application, there's a couple of um, important points to keep in mind. It's best to operate that irrigation equipment at a minimal rate, so put on as little as possible, even if it takes longer to get that material out there. Um, the faster we put it on, the more opportunity there is for ponding and runoff. And it's important 
just like in regular operations to monitor those um, continuously monitor the pumping operation so when we're we're doing everything we can to prevent a discharge the last thing we want is for a pump or a pipe to uh, to fail and we get a discharge as a result of that so so continuously monitor that um, and uh, monitor the the edges of that land application area to ensure that uh, runoff isn't occurring so we have setback distances for land application that currently exist in the state for small and medium APHOs and then for large CAFOs. Um, in a situation where we're dealing with saturated soil um, and we just need to get uh, that basin emptied, we wanna, if possible, maintain a greater separation distance um, between the application area and water bodies than our regulations normally dictate that we have to, um, that we have to maintain. So for small and medium animal feeding operations, um, the requirement there is at least a 30 foot setback from uh, waters of the state or, or sensitive areas. For large CAFOs, there's a couple different options. Um, they have to stay at least 100 feet back um, if there's no uh, best management practice in place along that uh, water body to prevent runoff. Um, if there is a, a practice in place, and one example would be a vegetated buffer, although there's others that can be um, that can be approved by the NDEQ. But if there's some um, acceptable best management practice in place, like a vegetative buffer, then that setback is reduced to 35 feet. So, um, kind of going back, if you're a, a large CAFO and you don't have a best management practice in place along a water body, you're going to want to stay much more than 100 feet back from the edge of that uh, water body if, if you can. Um, again, just another, another measure to try to uh, control the amount of runoff occurring from that site. So it's a good idea to have equipment on hand for um, creating a temporary berm or con a temporary containment structure when uh, when a lagoon level is getting high or a holding pond level is getting high or when um, land application is occurring on saturated soil. And so just a simple berm um, that will contain anything that runs off out of that um, holding pond if it does overflow or um, kind of a, a tailwater recovery at, at the, um, the low point of the field where run if runoff is going to occur, it's going to go there. And if we can contain that and, and prevent that from running off into waters of the state, then that material can be pumped and reapplied um, to the soil again. So um, there's a couple different places um, to contact for help. Um, First of all, NDEQ field inspectors um, can be contacted if you're in a situation where you do have a full uh, storage basin, you're not quite sure how to manage it, um, and they can help you, given your specific situation, decide the best um, approach to managing that basin. Again, the state um, office, the NDEQ Ag section, is uh, who needs to be contacted within 24 hours if there is a discharge. And um, I think the most important point here is maintaining those detailed records of your storage levels and pumping practices, because a dis that discharge is only allowed as part of your permit when all of those conditions of your permit have been met. So I've listed here the, the different offices for NDEQ in the state, um, the five field offices, and then the Lincoln Ag section are all up there. And I'll give a plug for one of our products from Nebraska Extension. We have a nutrient management record keeping calendar. And um, many of you are probably aware with this. Hopefully everybody has one, but if you don't, you can uh, contact your local extension office to get a free copy. Um, but so this calendar includes spaces for um, recording all of that information that I've talked about, the lagoon levels, the um, inspection of the berms, um, rainfall, precipitation, those sorts of things. So even if you're not a permitted operation, the calendar provides a way to keep records that, that could be valuable if you have a, um, a discharge from your site um, and, and get a visit from NDEQ. So above all, my, my closing point is keep records. Whether you're a permitted operation or not, um, record keeping is always recommended. It's required for permitted operations. Um, but like I said, those records could be um, very important if a discharge occurs to show that, that everything was managed correctly. Um, particularly during a period of, 
of unusually wet weather. Uh, it's really important to keep detailed and complete records of um, precipitation events, when they occur, how much, is, uh, how much precipitation falls, how that storage basin is being managed, and um, the land application practices being used. Um, so I, I can't really stress that enough, um, that need to, to keep records. So just a quick um, plug here for our animal manure management team. I've got the website address listed up there. Any of these folks are um, able to help out in a situation like this or get you to the person that you need to speak to. So manure.unl.edu and you can find uh, contact information for all of us. And um, that's the end of my presentation and I've put my email and phone number up here as well. If, if there's specific questions as a result of the presentation, um, I would be happy to uh, happy to help you out. So Galen, I'm gonna leave that evaluation slide up there and. Excellent, are there any questions from anybody? I have a couple of quick questions if there aren't any, but if there are, you can welcome to ask them now. Um, to start with Amy, I guess under normal, I'll say normal conditions, um, what I think, what I hear about as a challenge is if they're irrigating runoff pond water, not in excessive wet conditions, but just under normal conditions, one of the challenges if the pivot gets stuck or breaks or, and then they have runoff from the field, that's not allowed, is that correct? No, that's not allowed. And that, that comes back to that um, requirement to monitor the equipment during, during land application. So, you know, whether it's a pump or a pipe or, or that, that irrigation system getting stuck in water ponding or the effluent ponding, um, monitoring the system while it's running can, can help identify and take care of that issue before it um, leads to a discharge. I think for most permitted feed yards, the biggest challenge is this weekly or, or precipitation events monitoring of the pond height. Um, are there any automated ways or other ways that we can help? That, that seems to me like that's one of the harder record keeping things for them to always be doing on a weekly basis. Yeah, so, you know, precipitation, you can get data from a local weather station, but you know, weather can be pretty spotty and you could get two inches of rainfall in, in one location and uh, an inch, you know, a mile away. And so uh, it's really better to record that data specifically for your site. Um, as far as the pond level monitoring, I suspect that there are some uh, systems out there that operate with a float that would, um, that would record those, those levels. I don't know uh, how expensive they are, but maybe it would be worth it. Um, to save a person the time and, and hassle of making that uh, recording manually each week. But um, yeah, I mean, record keeping is, nobody likes to do it. Um, and you don't really realize how important it is until there's a situation where, uh, where you really need to show that things have gone correctly. And, you know, for, for permitted operations, it's, they have to turn those in with their uh, annual report at the end of the year. So, um, so those folks know the the routine pretty well, but yeah, it's um, I don't know. Maybe others on the call can can comment on whether or not there are some uh, automated methods. You know, weather stations that automatically record data with a data logger. Uh, but you know, again, the expense is is pretty hefty for those. And then my last comment or question, it's kind of a question is, a bit of a comment too is, is that um, really it's the, is it the record keeping proof that if they have a run over event or a, or a emergency pumping situation, the record keeping that they're going to request from NDEQ is essentially what was the pond levels and management going into those events. Is that fair? That's really that, that's why that record keeping is even more critical is is to show a month or six months prior to these events that they were managing the pond levels right so the record keeping is going to show that that you've been pumping when the opportunity was available and that you have um, you've maintained that 25 year 24 hour emergency storage um, depth within your um, storage so that if and when that 25-year, 24-hour storm occurs, if you've if you've managed that 
um, that holding pond to be below the emergency storage level, then it should be able to contain that um, that uh, emergency storm event. Um, so yeah, it's it's all in demonstrating that things have been done right prior to this issue arising, and that's the only way that the um, that the permit protects you from um, from being fined for a discharge is that it happened within the um, the regulations uh, laid out in the permit. Very good. Thank you for watching the webinar today. Um, I'll make one other comment related to if you have watched the program, we would strongly encourage you to come to go to this uh, web address and, and offer us your evaluation of today's program, what you learned, what you may still have questions about, and uh, give us a grade for how we're doing. With that, thanks, uh, Dr. Schmidt, for presenting today. And um, thanks for watching this. And uh, let us know if we can ever help with something.